This morning, as we come into worship, I would encourage you to join with me in looking at the beginning of one of my favorite psalms. It's Psalm 18. And in addition to looking at the first six verses, I'd like to also concentrate on the the description of the psalm that's given before verse 1 even starts. The description of the psalm, it says, For the director of music, of David the servant of the Lord, he sang to the Lord the words of this song, when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I've been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. And the remainder of this psalm is a beautiful description about how God directly intervened in David's life. And so this psalm is not a second-hand psalm. It's not what David heard of the Lord doing in someone else's life. It's what the Lord did in his life, how he directly intervened. And David gives this beautiful uh, psalm of love uh, to God. In the beginning of the psalm, he reflects the fact that times were, are not always good for him. The times are sometimes very difficult. And in those difficult times, he cries out to the Lord. And there is a season where he remains in the difficulty before God comes to answer. But when God answers, he really answers. And so this morning, you may be in very difficult times. Just like David Cry out to the Lord, wait on His timing, and let's see what God does. Join with me in worshiping this God, will you?
Lord, hear our prayers. We praise you for a successful transplant surgery, a woman received new lungs and a kidney. We pray for a complete recovery and blessings on the donor's family and friends. A parishioner is passing a kidney stone. We pray for this to occur soon with as little pain as possible. The daughter of a member will be entering a custody battle. We pray for your spirit to guide the trial and for your will to be done. The great-grandson of a parishioner crashed his motorcycle and broke both his legs. We're praying for a complete recovery, including full mobility. The, doctor of, uh, the daughter of a member recently had an MRI to diagnose her neck and back pain. Surgery is planned for her neck. We pray for a successful procedure. A member will be having multiple vein surgeries. We pray for successful treatments and safe travels back and forth to Murrieta. A young man had successful surgery to repair a depressed sternum. His pain is still intense from time to time. We pray for successful pain management and a swift, complete recovery. The son of a parishioner who expected to lose his job is being retained. We praise you. A parishioner is undergoing hyperbaric treatments. We pray that these treatments are successful and that antibiotics remove the toe infection. A friend of a parishioner went for cancer testing several weeks ago. We pray the tests come back negative. Our prayers are with those who have cancer. We pray for your healing touch, restoration, and wholeness. Lord, as we continue to experience challenges from the coronavirus, may we trust in you, patiently waiting for the day when life feels normal once again. David says at the conclusion of Psalm 38, O Lord, do not forsake me. Be not far away from me, my God. Come quickly to help me, O Lord, my Savior. And we close this time of prayer by praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you're going to use that one. Okay. Maybe. All right. So we say it and then we sing. Oh, and then, oh, oh, they're, they're getting the uh, cake. We gotta get oh, the that's cake. right. We gotta get the, cake. the cake comes oh, out. Oh, a cake. Then we yeah. sing when the cake comes out. Hey, yeah. look at this. I, I did yeah. it right. Even though I've said it for, but my brain went away about 10 years ago. Be present for you this year. But you Let, don't want let's, let's just try it. Okay. You got it? I guess. Okay. Congratulations. Wait a minute now. One, two, three. Congratulations, Congratulations on your birthday. birthday. We, we thank, thank God, God for you. you. Our hope and prayer is that the abundant life will be present. present. Is it just you very? put a very in? I put a very in there. Oh, she wrong. did a very because she's always a, does superlatives. <laughs> be okay. present Here for you go. this year. Sorry. Okay. Congratulations, Congratulations on your birthday. birthday. We, we thank God, God for you. you. Our hope and prayer is that the abundant life will be very present for you this year. year. I did the very. <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's it. Maybe it is very, and he didn't put it in here. No, no, okay. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. A professor at a Christian school walks into his class and begins that class by asking a very interesting question. He said, I want to know, did anyone of you this morning pray for $500 from the Lord? And all of the students are kind of giggling and looking at each other, kind of everyone thinking they had wished they had been the one praying for $500. And uh, after a few moments, there was a uh, woman in the back of the class who sheepishly raised her hand and said, you know, actually, I need $500, and, and that was my prayer this morning. And so he reaches into his wallet and he pulls out a 50 and he gives it to her and he said, there's $500 in that 50 in the same way that there is an oak tree uh, in an acorn. And what I want you to do is to watch what God is going to do with that. And so that, that piqued her uh, spiritual eyesight uh, for the remainder of that day to figure out what, what it is that God would do. And she's at the grocery store much later that day, just buying a few groceries, and the family ahead of her 
uh, had not enough money to pay for their groceries. And so she gives them the $50 and said, here, get what you need for your family. And the Bible says that when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. And you, you find that the Lord has a, a, a amazing interest rates. Uh, when the woman got home from the grocery store, uh, there was someone that drove up and they said, you know, I really feel impressed of God uh, to give you this $500 check. And that's a quick answer. And, and we love quick answers. Same day. Uh, but if all of the answers were, were, were that quick, uh, we'd be missing out on the kind of character that God is also seeking to build in us. And so most answers uh, to prayer will come more slowly because delayed answers, uh, they build interest and they build character. God is seeking to build character by how we steward our lives and how we steward our money. And so trusting and believing that God is the provider who will give all that we need when we need it, I'm going to ask that you would now um, look in your heart and ask God what it is that He's calling you to give this day.
nations eclipsed by glory And I realized just how beautiful you are And how great your affections are for me Oh, how he loves, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves us Oh, how he loves And we are his portion and he is our prize Drawn to redemption by the grace in his eyes, if his grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. And heaven meets the earth like an unforeseen kiss, and my heart turns violently inside of my chest, and I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about. I'm reading Philippians 2, 19 through 30. But, in, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel, like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed, he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. So I'd like you to imagine with me this morning a missionary who has served Christ really well and at times has served our congregation very well, that that missionary was arrested and jailed in a distant country because of preaching the gospel. And by the time the word reaches us of the condition of this missionary, uh, he's been in jail for well over a year because communication is that poor from this country. So we're meeting together and we think we, we've got to do something. We just can't do nothing. And so someone in the church says, well, what can we do? What are the options that are available to us? I mean, can we, can we hire a lawyer in that country? Can we post bail for this missionary? What, what all can we do? And at minimum, someone says, you know, at least let's take up a collection and, and send it to him to be able to alleviate uh, his conditions. 
Well, it sounds good, but the problem with that is that because of corruption and because of the primitive nature of this particular society, you just can't wire the money there. Um, so someone would have to physically take the offering to the missionary. And that would require some people from the congregation to put their life on hold for two and a half months or, or more because the travel is primitive and it's not completely safe. You don't know what you're going to get when you, when you, as you travel there. And so the elders throw it out to the congregation one Sunday morning. Hey, is anyone available to take up this collection that we would uh, receive? Could anyone take it to this missionary? Is anyone willing to set aside all of their plans for 10, maybe 12 weeks in order to do this? Now, think about everything you would have to rearrange in your life if you were going to be that person. Every plan that you've got for the next two and a half or three months would have to be pushed aside as you devoted yourself exclusively to this opportunity. I mean, who does that anyway? I mean, who volunteers for something like that? Well, I tell you, one person who just isn't doing anything with their life thinks, hey, well, that sounds like kind of an adventure. But would the elders be willing to entrust uh, potentially thousands of dollars of this contribution to someone uh, who doesn't do anything with their life. So the elders are saying, no, we need somebody who's not only available, but who's also responsible and reliable. And so no one actually volunteers the first week that the call goes out. The church gathers the next week, and everyone's a buzz because there's a rumor. The rumor is that one of the most responsible people in the entire church, a man who everyone trusts has actually volunteered to do this. And it's got everybody else in the church thinking, you know what, if that man is willing to completely rearrange his life for the next two and a half or three months, the least I can do is to contribute a lot more to this offering than I had initially thought. And so it's announced that this trusted individual will take up the collection, which will happen next week. Can you imagine what that collection is going to look like? It's going to be a lot. A lot more than anyone imagined. And when this person finally gets it to the missionary and they receive this, this collection, this offering, this expression of love and concern, uh, they're going to write back. And it's going to be two and a half months later, but they're going to they're write back. Folks, that's how we got our letter in the Bible called Philippians. It's because the church loved the Apostle Paul. They heard about his imprisonment. They decided to take up a collection for him, but they needed someone responsible and available to courier that money straight to Paul. And it was a man named Epaphroditus. And so Paul receives the offering. Uh, he is deeply grateful because of it. Uh, and it's not just because of the, the cash, the offering. It's what that represents. It represents a deep concern that this church has for him that he's not forgotten even though he's been in jail now for almost two years. Folks, Christianity flourished in the first century because of men like Paul were willing to put their life on the line continuously to preach the gospel. And men like Epaphroditus were willing to put everything else aside for a season to help support the cause in a full-time capacity. When Paul first established the church in Philippi a decade earlier, he had made quite a stir in that city. And a lot of people responded, but there was a lot of uh, resistance, and immediate resistance. And eventually Paul is beaten and he's thrown into prison. Eventually he has to leave that city. Uh, and then he goes on to the next town, Thessalonica. Uh, and he again, he makes quite a stir. And a great multitude in Thessalonica responded positively. But again, uh, not only was a church born, there was a lot of resistance that flared up as well. And that resistance went to the authorities in the city of Thessalonica, and they made the following accusation. They said, these men who have turned the world upside down 
have come here. The kind of character that takes the world upside down, it's evidenced in the life and in the relational patterns of Paul and two of his co-workers that are mentioned in the scripture that Trish read this morning, Timothy and Epaphroditus. The church today could use a lot more of that character and that brand of relationship. In terms of character, Paul had an unreserved commitment to Jesus Christ. And he lived to win people to Christ. I mean, well into his fourth quarter, he tells the leaders uh, of a church in Ephesus, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul's greatest priority was not his own welfare. It was the advance of Christ's cause. And at that moment, the cause of Christ in the city of Philippi would be advanced by, first of all, expressing his gratitude for their sacrificial gift and by addressing a small but a growing rift in the church that Epaphroditus talked with Paul about. The rift was between two very strong-willed women. And Paul pleads for unity by writing earlier in this chapter, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then Paul folds in the lyrics of a first century song uh, that illustrates the extent to which Jesus did not merely look out for his own personal interests, but made himself completely available to the interests of his Father. And then right after including those lyrics, Paul writes about two other men that the Philippians know, both of these men, whose lives are examples of humility and, and being focused on others that really advance the gospel. And these two men are Epaphroditus and Timothy. Both of these men were drawn into the orbit of Paul's character and Paul's commitment to Christ. And both of them, like Paul, risked their lives for the sake of the gospel. Basically, Paul is saying by their life, by their sacrifice, by their attitudes, they point you to the humility and the service of Christ. So let's look first of all at what Paul says about Timothy so that we might gain that kind of character ourselves. He says, I hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you shortly, verse 19. And then he describes him as being genuinely concerned for your welfare, verse 20. And while others seek their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus, Timothy is different, Paul says. He's got proven worth, having served with me in the furtherance of the gospel. Timothy's life tells you that the kind of life that I've been talking about in this letter, it's possible. He's living it out. You've seen it in him, and you know it's true. It's also true that Timothy did not have the force of personality that Paul did, that he struggled with insecurity and timidity, but Christ powerfully uses people like Timothy who are genuine in their concern for others and who are just available to go wherever and do whatever is needed. So Paul was keen on sending Timothy to the Philippians soon, but he's going to send Epaphroditus back to them now. And I want you to note the honor that Paul gives Epaphroditus in this letter. Now, remember that Epaphroditus had traveled 750 miles to get from Philippi to Rome. That's the equivalent of walking from here to Oregon, the border between California and Oregon, if we were to go north, or if we were to go east, to walk from here to Albuquerque. And Paul is basically saying, well, I'm not sending Timothy to you right away. I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, 
my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier who is also your messenger and minister to my need. Paul bestows tremendous honor on this man, puts him basically on equal terms with himself. He says, he's my brother. He's my fellow worker. We're right alongside of each other. He's my fellow soldier, right alongside of each other. He's one with me in sympathy and in service and in suffering. And then in verse 25, he says, he is your messenger. That's a very interesting title because that word messenger in the Greek is apostolos. He is your apostle. The word apostle literally means sent one. He's the one that was sent from you. He's your apostle. So think of what it did for Epaphroditus for the remainder of his life to carry that title, the apostle, bestowed on him by none other than the apostle Paul. Now, Epaphroditus nearly died from sickness that he contracted on this long journey. And yet, Epaphroditus was concerned to get this collection to Paul no matter what, as well as he was concerned about the trouble he might be causing Paul because of his sickness. And in addition to that, he worried that his sickness might be heard from his home church and they'd be all worried about that. So he's, t- he's putting others' welfare ahead of his own. I mean, no wonder Paul writes in verse 29, receive him, receive Epaphroditus in the Lord with all joy and you hold men like him in high regard. You know, we become more and more like what we honor and who we honor by what we highly regard and by who we highly regard. And Paul says this man's devotion His willing availability and his sacrifice, it's worthy of your honor. I mean, who he is, what he has done, has brought me so much joy. And no wonder he's enfolded into this epistle of joy. Now, Paul's writing this letter, and he's writing it either on parchment or on sheepskin. Either one is very expensive. And then he gives it to Epaphroditus to say, okay, now, now take these, this letter back to the Philippians. Just a couple of thoughts about Epaphroditus taking that letter back. Number one, where does a prisoner get the money to buy expensive material, whether it's parchment or sheepskin, to write the letter on? Well, It's a small part of the very offering that was just sent to him. So what they gave as a gift to Paul is coming back to them in the form of an apostolic letter. When you give to God's cause, God will return. God will return a blessing. And then secondly, You could crudely label Epaphroditus nothing more than an errand boy. But just like that little boy whose small lunch fed thousands of people in Jesus' day, Epaphroditus, uh, that little letter would feed and it would inspire millions of people. And Epaphroditus gets to carry it. All of this because he, like Paul, like Timothy, they were available. They were available. Four times in this this paragraph, this portion of Scripture, Paul uses the word sent or send, as well as talking about Epaphroditus being an apostle, describing uh, one sent. So these men, they're not pew sitters. They're not observers only. They are ready volunteers who are available, available for whatever task advances the gospel, whatever task. When I became a chaplain for the fire department in the city of Stockton, California, it put me on a steep learning curve because I had no idea of the the culture and the milieu of of a fire department. I'd never been in a firehouse before in my life. So I had to learn all of the technical descriptions that are thrown about 
uh, with, by firefighters uh, casually, like the difference between an engine and a truck. You've got to know that if you're going to be the chaplain. You have to know how much CFM can flow through a five-inch hose. Uh, I had to learn the abbreviations that they use uh, on the air, on the radio all the time. You know, whether they talk about BLS or ALS, whether it's basic life support or advanced life support. And then they would always use this, this uh, set of initials whenever they got back to the firehouse, they would always say that they were AOR. AOR. You know, truck 5, AOR. AOR means available on radio or available on request. And I witnessed firefighters thrust into unbelievable situations because they were AOR. I've seen firefighters save lives. I've seen firefighters change people's futures because they were AOR, available on request or on the radio. Paul changed his world and he changed ours because he was available. Timothy and Epaphroditus, the same. They changed their world because they were available. I mean, unfortunately, we like the idea of being available and service without actually serving and going out of our way. So let me ask you, when was the last time that you got alone with God and you expressed your availability, your availability to go wherever, to do whatever? When was the last time you picked up, as it were, your mic and declared, God, I'm AOR. I may not be the Apostle Paul, but you know what? Neither was Timothy or Epaphroditus. They weren't Paul, but they were available. They had picked up their mics and they had declared, A-O-R, God, whatever, wherever. You know, I was thinking about availability in terms of ministry and the, the church here in Idlewild. I thought about what ministry currently touches more number of people than any other ministry that happens here at this church. And I realize it's not even a contest. I mean, hands down, currently, it's our thrift shop. I mean, hundreds of people come each week from our city, from our region, to shop there. And tens of thousands of dollars every year are sent to support missionaries literally all around the globe. And so, when heaven's books are opened, and we see the impact of this church on eternity, listen, selling trinkets and used clothes and worn shoes don't seem like much in terms of eternal impact. But I'm sure that someone could have said the same thing about Epaphroditus. You're going back home with little more than just a letter. You're just an errand boy, that's all. But that's all God needed to impact eternity. Ministry in this congregation, it puts a lot of demands on my time and my energy, but I'm privileged to help set up every Tuesday at the thrift store. And my wife, who read the scripture, is privileged to help as a cashier on Thursdays. So right now, right now, would you pick up your mic and would you declare to God, I am AOR. And then listen for the broadcast from heaven. It might be happening right now in your life. It might be a whisper. It might be a sermon. It might be a prompting. It might be a scripture. It might be a circumstance. It might be a word from another Christian brother or sister. It may be that the Spirit is speaking to your spirit right now about an errand that the Lord told you to do, and it's still undone, still unacted on. It's not too late to say, okay, God, I got the transmission. I'm available. I'll do it. And when it comes to service, it, it may be in the thrift shop. 
It may be in other areas of the life of our church or our community. But I plead with you just simply to be like Paul, like Epaphroditus, like Timothy, available. Let's pray to that extent, shall we? Lord Jesus, we pray, knowing ourselves enough to know that we so often resist availability and we so often give excuses as to why we are not available. We know that about ourselves and so we pray that the the power of your Holy Spirit would come and just break that wall of pride and unavailability and break through it. And I pray that you would speak directly into the heart of everyone who hears this word to be available in a very specific way to that which advances your cause, even the cause of Jesus Christ, who was completely available to the Father and whose work on the cross gives us a salvation that we could get no other way. So Jesus, we thank you And we pray that the same Holy Spirit that motivated you would motivate us and lead us to advance your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.